This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. You will hear a conversation between a psychiatrist in the medical center of the college and a new student. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to four. Hello, sit down, please. Thank you. Now, you are a new patient, aren't you? Y yes, that's right. OK, so I'd better get some basic details down first. Right, we'll start with your name. Martin Hansen. Do you spell that S-O-N or S-E-N? H-A-N-S-E-N. OK, and you're a first-year student? Yes, I am. Study in? Uh, electronics, actually. Ah, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. And your address? Uh, 2805 Hesperian Avenue, Hayward. 2805 and Hesperian. Yes, that's H-E-S-P-E-R-I-A-N. Hayward, H-A-Y-W-A-R-D. And your phone number? 734-246-55. 734-26455. No, you got the 6 and the 4 the wrong way round. It's 24655. Huh? Sorry. Right. And um, when were you born? Uh, the 15th of June, 1986. Here in New Zealand? No, I was born in Sydney. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 5 to 10. Good. So, what's your problem? Well, frankly, I wonder whether it is a problem. I get the blues, and it lasts for quite a while. I don't know how to... Yes, we all feel sad or get the blues now and again. Generally, our sadness lessens in time and with the support of friends. However, if the depression leads to difficulty in thinking and greatly disrupts your daily routine, it can be evidence of a psychiatric problem. What do you feel exactly? I always feel sad and worthless. I find it hard to fall asleep and wake up early in the morning. How long has it lasted? Nearly half a month. Do you feel fatigue or loss of energy? Or you may have lost interest or pleasure in usual activities? Yes, sometimes. At first, I thought I could overcome it by myself, but I failed, and that... I'm so glad that you came here. It seems that you are suffering mild depression from your symptoms. Depression? Yes, I feel depressed sometimes. But why would I... Depression may occur as a result of biochemical changes in the body. Alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine, and LSD can bring on depression. Those who have a family history of depression usually have a greater risk of depression. Sometimes the worrying changes in life can lead to depression. I see. I had a really bad breakup of a love relationship. It makes me feel hopeless. Do you think I need some treatment? Yes. Antidepressant medications are often used to treat depression, if it is serious. But I don't suggest them at first because of the side effects. I suggest psychotherapy, which can give you support and help you regain control. 
So do I need to come here every day? No, I will arrange counselling sessions for you, which will last 12 to 20 weeks. You come here once or twice each week. The psychotherapy is directed at helping you gain insight and understanding about events in your life, which may have contributed to your depression. With growing insight, you can often learn more effective ways of coping with your feelings and changing your behaviour. What can I do to take care of myself? Well, at first you should do some physical exercises on a regular basis, at least three times a week. How is your food? Do you eat well? Mm, yes, I think so. I eat at my homestay family. Good. Find a hobby or a positive recreational activity to participate in once or twice a week. I know it's difficult for you, though. When you feel it's hard to overcome the depression, come to the counselling session. Remember, ask for help if the load is too heavy to handle. Yes, I'll try. So, when will my counselling session begin? I'm going to arrange that for you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You are going to hear a lecture about the Miner's Hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 11 to 14. Good evening and welcome to the Minor Hotel. We are pleased to have you as our guest. I will give you a brief information session to tell you everything you need to know to make this a pleasant stay. The Minor Hotel was built in the 1850s, during the Gold Rush period, also nicknaming our state the Golden State. People from all over the country and even from other countries came to seek their fortune here in these hills, creating cities overnight. In this city, many Gold Rush hotels soon opened up. This particular hotel was built in 1851, but was destroyed during an earthquake. It was rebuilt in 1995 to recreate the feel of the Gold Rush, complete with articles and actual photographs from during the 1850s. Our hotel is divided into two buildings, one called the Gold Tower, and the other is named the Fortune Tower. You will be staying in the Fortune Tower on the 25th floor, complete with great views of the city. Your room is the best room in the hotel, complete with private living room and hot tub. Here is your room card. On the card it will say FT, meaning Fortune Tower. On the bottom of the card it will say 2515. The 25 stands for the 25th floor, and the 15 stands for the 15th room on that particular floor. Now look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 15 to 20. There are emergency exits in both towers of the hotel. They are located on the south side, opposite the elevators. Please use these in case of a fire or other emergency. We have some special events happening this week. Our Miner's Diner is offering a special Miner's Buffet dinner this Friday and Saturday for only $20 per person. This special includes all food, not including drinks and alcohol, and shows for the night. The buffet will be available from 5 to midnight. Because of the historical significance of our hotel, there are some special rules. The first rule is that there is no smoking allowed anywhere in the building, not even in your own room. This is not only to ensure the safety and health of our guests, but also the furniture and pictures can be easily damaged by smoke and other harsh treatment. 
Please remember that there are items of furniture over a hundred years old here, so respect the rules by not smoking. Secondly, please do not take pictures using a flash of any of the drawings and paintings in the rooms or hallways as they are old and fragile. We are doing our best to preserve a national treasure, so please help us in doing so. Lastly, you will only have one set of towels and bed sheets per three days. This is to conserve the water supply, as there are frequent droughts this high up in the hills. If there are any further questions, the staff of the hotel will be available to answer your questions. In the event that no one is able to answer your questions, I will also be available from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day in the concierge. I hope you enjoy your stay here with us. Thank you very much. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear two engineering students, a woman in her sixth year called Linda and a man in his fifth year called Matthew, discussing the benefits of student work placements. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, Linda. Can you spare a few minutes? Hello, Matthew. No problem. I just wanted to talk to you about temporary work placements. I've never really thought there was a good reason for doing one. I've got some savings, so I don't really need the money at the moment. But I've had an email from the university about a vacancy that looks quite interesting. You did a placement last year, didn't you? I did, yes. In my case, I wanted to find out if I was making the right career choice before I began applying for permanent jobs. I thought I wanted to work in car manufacturing, but I wasn't sure, so I applied to Toyota. What was the application process like? Lengthy. There were a lot of different parts to it. The dullest one was a psychometric test. You know, when you have to answer loads of questions about yourself. And you're trying to guess what's the best thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Then there was an activity that we did in groups, which I found really fascinating. Engineers are renowned for being a bit unsociable, but I thought we made a great team. And we had an individual task, too. We had to sort through various business documents and prioritize them. It was just like what you have to do as a student, really, just with different content. What exactly were you doing on the placement? I was helping to design some diagnostic software to identify any waste in the car assembly process. Do you mean waste of materials? No, time. Anything that can speed the process up helps to cut costs. How did the work placement compare to being a student? Was it hard work? Yes, it was. I'd had full-time work before. I've done various unskilled jobs during university holidays, and some of those involve long hours. So I thought I'd find it easy. I was wrong, though. I think when you're on placement, you're always trying to prove yourself. So you push yourself hard to succeed? Yes. But I got a lot of support from my employers. They were always helpful. And then, at the end of the placement, I was given formal feedback. Do you mean on your engineering ability? Well, no. I didn't really need that because we had team meetings every other day. And so I had the chance to discuss technical issues and ask about anything that wasn't clear. The evaluation was about general workplace things, like organizational ability, initiative, 
that sort of thing. I get the impression you think you benefited from the placement. Well, the best thing is that they've offered me a job for next year. Depending on my exam results, of course, but still. A permanent one? Yes. But apart from that, I learned so much. The industrial environment was much more demanding than the academic one. So my general skills improved, like time management, meeting deadlines. And on the technical side, I learned new software packages, like MS Project. Well, I think you've convinced me that work placements are worthwhile, but while you're here, can you give me advice on something else? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I am about to make a start on the engineering materials module and I've got a book list here. Can you have a quick look and tell me what you would recommend? That's if you can remember. Let's see. I do remember some of them. Hmm. Yes, this one. The Science of Materials. I found the subject quite hard generally, but this book is very accessible, so it suited me. It doesn't cover everything, though. What about this one, then? Materials Engineering. Oh, yes. I do remember that. But it's a bit out of date now, isn't it? Unless it's a new edition. I don't think so. But what I liked about it were the pictures. They really helped to understand the descriptions. It's useful just from that point of view. Let's see. What else? Oh, yes. That one there. Engineering Basics. I think out of all these, that's got the widest coverage. But I've looked at the contents page and it hardly mentions nanotechnology. Yes, you're right. The evolution of materials does, though. It's a recent publication, so it covers all the latest developments. It's a bit thin on the 1960s, though, and that decade was quite important. Well, it sounds as if they all complement each other in some ways. I don't suppose you can lend me... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You will hear a talk given by Don Parker, an expert on computer security, about the computer criminals. As you listen to the talk, fill in the gaps numbered 31 to 40. First, you will have some time to look at the notes below. Now listen to the talk. Hi there. As an expert on computer security, my job is to oversee and analyse the phenomenon in computer users. Computer has been commonplace in our daily life, make our life and work efficiently and lively. However, with the development of the computer technology, computer crime has come to arise more people's attention. Now, in respect of this topic, I will present some of my view and studies. What kinds of people are perpetrating most of the information technology crime? According to my research, over 80% may be employees. The rest are outside users, hackers and crackers and professional criminals. It is amazing that employees amount for this large portion. Let us see them in detail. Employees. Employees are those with the skills, the knowledge and the access to do bad things. 
dishonest or disgruntled employees pose a far greater problem than most people have realised. To most supervisors and some experts, they worry that dishonest employees or outsiders can more easily intercept communications or steal company trade secrets. Workers may use information technology for personal profit or steal hardware or information to sell. They may also use it to seek revenge for real or imagined wrongs, such as being passed over for promotion. Sometimes they may use the technology simply to demonstrate to themselves that they have the power over people. This may have been the case with a, a Georgia printing company employee, convicted of sabotaging the firm's computer system. As files mysteriously disappeared and the system randomly crashed, other workers became so frustrated and enraged that they quit. Outside users, suppliers, and clients may also gain access to companies' information technology and use it to commit crime. With both, this becomes more a possibility as electronic connections, such as electronic data interchange systems, become commonplace. Hackers and crackers. What are hackers? Hackers are people who gain unauthorized access to computer or telecommunication systems for the challenge or even the principle of it. Crackers also gain unauthorized access to information technology, but do so for malicious purposes. Crackers attempt to break into computers and deliberately obtain information for financial gain, to shut down hardware, pirate software, or destroy data. The tolerance for hackers, as the benign explorer, has decreased. Most communication systems administrators view any kind of unauthorized access as a threat, and they pursue the offenders vigorously. And educators also try to point out to students that university cannot provide an education for everybody if hacking continues. Professional criminals, members of organized crime rings, don't just steal information technology; they use it in a legal way as a business tool, but for illegal purposes. For instance. Databases can be used to keep track of illegal gambling debts and stolen goods. Drug dealers have used pages as link to customers. Microcomputers, scanners, and printers can be used to forge checks, immigration papers, passports, and driver's licenses. Telecommunications can be used to transfer funds illegally. As information technology crime has become more sophisticated, in 1988. After the last widespread internet break-in, the U.S. Department created the Computer Emergency Response Team, or CERT. Although it has no power to arrest or prosecute, CERT provides round-the-clock international information and security-related support services to users of the internet. Whenever it gets a report of an electronic snooper, whether on the internet or on a corporate email system, CERT stands ready to lend assistance. It counsels the party under attack, helps them thwart the intruder, and evaluates the system afterwards to protect against future break-ins. That is the end of part four. You will have thirty seconds to check your answers.